Thank you very much for those kind words. And uh, let me say that it's uh, been a fabulous day I've had here. Um, I started off going around the Minster with some superb guides provided by uh, some of your staff. And uh, it really was a joy. And then I've spent the rest of the day on this new campus and also going around the laboratories here in computer science. And it really is amazingly impressive. So it's both an honor and a pleasure to be here today as the university takes another great step forward with this splendid building and the amazing campus that is really underway here and an investment of 750 million for this campus uh, expansion I think is a true credit to uh, the vision and the expertise that is embedded in York University and I think this is exactly the time to do it even though these are hard times and I'll talk more about that in a moment uh, it is the companies and the organisations that have the vision and the drive that go on to thrive and, and I'm sure you, York University is going to be no exception here. Um, everybody I know who I've met in the building now admittedly uh, is not really term time and I'm a visitor so everybody's being nice to me. Uh, but they, they do seem to be genuinely impressed. It does seem to be a fabulous step forward and you know the, the whole feel of the place is tremendous. So John, you know, you and your team should be commended on the work that you've done here. This is really outstanding. Um, I'll talk more about the building later, but one of the things I wanted to do was to talk about and consider the environment within which that we, we all work and the challenges that we all face. Um, I think I ought to warn you, dear listener, as the saying goes, I'm going to talk about some sort of far-reaching and global topics here. And I think that's entirely appropriate for a university that draws students from all over the world and then goes on to produce leaders for all over the world. Today, all of us have seen very many changes and opportunities which act as driving forces in our lives. And I really want to focus upon three that we've seen emerge across the world. The first of these in recent times has to be the huge financial shock, which started in September 2008, and the effects of which are still being felt and actually being considered. This wasn't just a banking crisis, although that was clearly the trigger. This was a major discontinuity in our economic and commercial systems worldwide. The failing of major financial institutions heralded a total rethink about our whole systems, our processes, our beliefs, and even how we work and how we're organized. Post-crisis, we saw the effects on industry, not just the more obvious financial challenges, but a fundamental rethink about purpose. Many of the more astute companies saw this as a major system reset and started to re-engineer their processes, their people, the information, and even questioning and then reconfirming what the fundamental purpose and the core business was. It was as if the financial crisis had given them the mandate to revisit the drawing board and plan afresh. In doing so, we at IBM have been lucky to work with many of these companies and we've seen that actually technology was a major enabler and practically everybody saw this on the path ahead and it was a key tool to help in this evolution. And I think that brings me on to the role of computer science as the second of these great drivers of change. As we stand here in this great new building, it's entirely appropriate, I think, to think of computer science, one of the newest and most powerful of all sciences. And I know we can have an interesting debate for many an hour on whether or not it is a science. I happen to believe it is in the way, and certainly it is in the way it's taught in this university. And in the past, computer science has sometimes been considered as a dark art with high priests guarding boxes in windowless rooms. Nothing could be further from the truth, as you can see here in this building today, and the amazing worldwide applications of the discipline and where the talents go on to be used. For many years now, computer science has underpinned many of the recent advances in other disciplines, such as physics, astronomy, biology, and chemistry. We simply could not have made the progress in those areas without the step change in computational power and the ability to handle what has been known as big data. And this isn't just the output from particle accelerators. The, this is the fundamental fabric of our life now, the internet and the digital content and media. The amount of data that is swimming out there is exponentially increasing and our ability to use it for good is one of the fundamental challenges. 
So across the world, I think we're seeing a new phenomena as computer science enables us to address some of the biggest challenges we face. Things such as food availability, water supply, distribution of energy and security, both physical and cyber, city congestion and environmental modelling. We live in an age where many of the existing processes that we all depend upon can no longer cope, adapt or respond to meet current needs. And just as importantly now, the answers that we come up with have to be sustainable and they have to be for the benefit of all. Consumers, businesses and governments are increasingly focused on socially responsible actions. It's quite interesting now, even on Wall Street, everybody's expected to turn in good numbers. But people are increasingly looking at how those numbers are achieved, how sustainable is the management team, how sustainable is the actions or those actions of the team, and what steps are being made to future-proof in terms of sustainability. Much of our planet's natural and financial resources now are simply being squandered by using business and ideas as simple as normal. We're not really optimising in a way that we can. 50% of all food produced in the world never makes it to the consumer's table. And nearly 35% of all water used in agriculture is lost. Road congestion, poor routing, non-integrated transport systems all around the world waste enough crude oil to meet the total demand of Germany and Netherlands for two years. This level of waste is no longer sustainable, desirable or acceptable. Much of this inefficiency can be attributed to the way we've optimised the world in silos, with little understanding or regard for how the world's processes interrelate or are in fact a system of systems. As the world grows more interconnected day by day, the inefficiencies of this siloed approach is increasingly apparent. Clearly technology can and is helping us here. History has shown that technological advances have been precursors to tremendous economic and social progress. Now with many common standards and even the transistor, the most basic of components costing only a fraction of a penny, computers in all forms have become ubiquitous, enabling us to interconnect objects, people and processes. So the work that's done here on embedded systems is absolutely a very important focus. It also enables us to instrument and embed intelligence in a way that we've never done before. And the inevitable consequence of this is that we are able to break down the silos and create a new way of combining talents, solving challenges and understanding where physical meets digital. We can understand and exploit these system of systems rather than be confused or swamped with the data. As John referred earlier, this is how IBM is aligned around the Smarter Planet agenda. Improving the, world, the way the world works, or as we call it, Smarter Planet, is not an abstract as aspiration, it's an increasingly urgent imperative. There are three basic elements to this, and I'm sure you can see this reflected in the work that's being undertaken here. The world is becoming rapidly instrumented. Embedded sensors, now plentiful and affordable, are creating a world of smart objects. Everything is capable of being monitored. There are now over a billion transistors for every human being on this planet. So everything is being interconnected. And then beyond that, there are nearly two billion people connected to the internet. And every day we're linking in excess of three to four trillion in total smart objects to the systems together. With the application of powerful systems and advanced analytics to accompany that input, our processes are able to become more intelligent. And the mass of data that is generated can lead to smarter actions. I think we are actually entering into a new age, the age of collaboration and advanced intelligence. No less significant, in my view, than some of the more well-known ages, such as steam and railways, automobiles and mass production, information and telecoms. Just pick your favourite. Sometimes when you're in the heart of something, it's very hard to see the historical perspective. I think when we look back, we'll begin to see that we are on an amazing acceleration forward with this technology. The adoption rate is truly astounding. So what now of the third change I referred to earlier? the notion of sustainability, not only of the systems and the processes, but of the very lives that we lead. This has become one of the most powerful forces. 
And one of the most obvious and visible manifestations of sustainability has been that of the planet itself and climate change. Sadly, I think it took the Stern Report of 2006 to make world governments sit up and notice when the effects could be expressed in the monetary terms of cost-benefit. This may be sad, but if that's the currency of communication, then I think we, ne we need to learn how to use it. This, however, is also changing because whilst the language of economics is powerful, individuals and societies have now taken up the cause, and I think sustainability has gone viral which I think can only be a good thing for all of us and our children. At a very simple and basic level, we know it cannot be right that the average apple we see on the supermarket shelf has travelled over 3,000 miles before it got here. One in five people in the world today still do not have safe drinking water. On a larger scale, we can see that the challenges of the affordability and the shape of our public services here in the UK are being considered. What are the services and what are the institutions that we now need in this world and what do we need in this country to sustain us? It's estimated that traffic congestion alone in the US costs the planet $78 billion every year. Even more sharply, given where we're all standing or rather where we're all sitting, we've seen changes in how we fund universities in England. I knew this would be a good time to pause. <laughs> Whatever your views, I think it is very clear that we must find a sustainable model and it must embrace both the notion of access and the aspiration to produce world-class talent. Our challenge is to find the ways of squaring this particular circle and doing it in such a way that we've actually moved forward and we've evolved and we've optimised the system in a fair and sustainable way. Never before, I think, have we seen the start of so many changes and opportunities driven by a very major rethink of many of our commercial structures, the application of the next generation of technology, and the need to create and embrace sustainable solutions. And the pace of this change is truly breathtaking. As the old order is torn down and replaced, the critical need is for top-class talent. And this, I think, brings us back full circle to the building here today. Talent and the production of it is at a global premium. And we're seeing the innovation model, which is now global, open and collaborative, bringing businesses and universities together for mutual benefit. At IBM, we greatly value and appreciate the work we've done with York University in the past and the work that we want to do in the future. This has covered research and teaching from the International Technology Alliance Software Systems Engineering Initiative, large-scale complex IT systems programs through supporting visiting professors, talks, secondments, one-on-one -on -one interactions, and many more. And I think the tribute is a lot of these happen organically. They happen bottom-up. They happen peer-to-peer. -peer. They're not directed by me and they're not directed by John. This is an, an understanding of people getting together to solve problems. And as John mentioned, the impetus to set up an undergraduate degree in enterprise systems um, came from industry with IBM and Credit Suisse. So again, I think we're brought back to the great new building here, which will help advance the discipline of computer science. It will teach future practitioners, and perhaps most importantly, enthrall and inspire the next generation of technical leaders, which this world so great, greatly and critically needs. Thank you very much. Thank you.